Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly, all streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30 day trial, go to Netflix.com slash twit. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Meaning of Life episode number 42 of Frame Rate. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Brian Brushwood. And that was Alderaan shooting first. Did you notice that? Alderaan shot first in the new Blu-rays, huh? No, that's the, uh, that's the latest change. Alderaan, because he felt <laughs> too menacing, especially because the, the whole story is a redemption of Darth Vader. You can't have this Death Star just destroy yeah, no. millions of people. You that's gotta have too a evil. Yeah, so he made he made Alderaan shoot first. You'll never believe it. All right, uh, and folks on the audio podcast, if you don't know what we're talking about, check our show notes, twit.tv slash FR. We'll have a link to that in there. Joining us on Frame Rate this week, very excited to have Scott Wilkinson. He's the host of the Home Theater Geek Show right here on the Twit Network, also online editor of hometheater.com, and knows his stuff about the home theater. We're going to learn a lot from you, Scott. Good to have you on the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me on. It's, uh, it's great to, to have you along for the ride. Let's start off with the big story. This just in, the big story. So the big story this week comes from Wired's Gadget Lab blog. Uh, it's written by Christina Bonington, talking about the fact that smart TVs are not taking off. Now, Brian and I had a raging debate about whether apps in televisions are worth it or not, and I was making the point like, yeah, I want the set-top box to be integrated in the television. The apps on the TV isn't it. I want to have the Google TV inside my television. Then you can just do firmware upgrades. Brian said, absolutely not. I want my TV to be a dumb monitor so I can upgrade the hardware when I want to upgrade it. Scott, where do you come down on this? Do you want set-top boxes that are separate, or do you mind having it built in so it's all in a nice, clean box? I have to say I'm with Brian on this one. I, <laughs> I, uh, I really do prefer having the, uh, the streaming and the apps and all that stuff in the set-top box, in particular Blu-ray players. Um, I, I'm all about quality, so I really like the quality of Blu-ray, but when I want the convenience of streaming uh, or to do some other kind of app, uh, you know, having it be in the same box as the Blu-ray player is really good. I like that, and uh, it also makes it a lot easier to upgrade uh, sure, you, as you said, you could do firmware up updates to the TV, um, but the, you know the Blu-ray player is a hundred bucks, two hundred bucks, so it's going to be a lot easier to upgrade that either by firmware or by buying another box than it is the TV. So uh, I have to say I prefer it in the TV. On the other hand, I will also say I disagree with this big story uh, that uh, you know smart TVs are not doing very well. I mean, maybe they are or aren't. I don't really know the numbers, but I think that smart TV functionality is just like 3D uh, TV functionality, which is that it's just, it's just another feature that manufacturers are adding into the TV, and you can use it or you don't have to use it as you wish. It's not really costing you that much more. And actually, well, Bonington does acknowledge that in the story. She says the reason these TVs are selling is not because they have the smart TV platform in them. It's because they're the right. best TVs, and they just come yes. with the most features. Yeah, there's another follow-up quote that says, uh, this is uh, uh, Van Baker, a vice president at the research fir firm Gartner, quote, less than half the internet-connected televisions actually get connected to the internet, so clearly consumers don't see this capability as a must-have feature. And I, I ran through this last year. I got my, uh, my new uh, Samsung, which I love. It's a great display, and I was intrigued by the novelty of plugging it in to do surfing. I, I plugged it in for just the one time. I watched a couple of YouTube videos. I 
linked up to my Flickr account, and I haven't even done anything. I think I, I think I unplugged it over a year ago now, and haven't gone back to it. <laughs> <laughs> now, in our informal survey of frame rate audience members who wrote in. Uh, on my side of the argument, with the sort of old-fashioned, like, you know, I liked the television when it was just a television. It had the tuner built in, and you didn't have to plug anything else in. On my side of the argument, we had one person who wrote in and said, I can kind of see Tom's side of the story, but I agree with Brian. On Brian's side was everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, but, but again, and it's one of those things, like, I understand that, that, that um, we are at a place where there's going to be a big, big jump to the next 4K displays. We're, we're not in a place where you could keep getting this incremental increase in quality. We're about to have a big, big gulf, which means until prices come down, the manufacturers have to rely on novelty. They have to rely on stuff like 3D that they could use their existing displays to do or, or internet connectivity where they could just, you know, buy an extra $100 of hardware and slap it in there. Um, but that's not what anybody wants. We want increasingly crisp, clear, beautiful displays. And if we're at a, if we're at a leveling off point, then consumers really are going to sit here until 4K displays become uh, readily available. Now, mark my Which is words. happen. Go ahead, Scott. I was going to say that that may happen sooner than we think. We at the Cedia trade show uh, that I just returned from, um, we saw the first consumer 4K displays uh, being shown, and they will be available by the end of the year. Of course, there's no content for it. <laughs> right, right. This is like getting HD in like 1998, right? Well, I mean, yes, yeah, exactly. You, you can you can generate content. Uh, I remember I bought my first uh, 1080p 37-inch television because I wanted it to be a monitor for my desktop computer, and it was it was mm -hmm. close enough to the type of resolutions I was accustomed to on my PC. It was just gigantic, and it made playing Battlefield 2 a freaking amazing experience. Those I believe are surprisingly going to be some of the first early adopters on the 4K displays because you can already now have hardware to play your games at that level of resolution. At least I assume so. Yeah, I mean, well, I, but are the go ahead, Scott. I was going to ask, are the games uh, man, uh, set up and, and are they displayed? Do they have 4K native resolution or are they being upconverted? I, I don't know. I'm not a gamer. Obviously, that's going to be all over the map. But at the very least, you'll be able to have a desktop environment that you can run at that. And, of course, if you have super high res resolution photos or even, um, you know, uh, even up samples. I, in fact, I wouldn't be surprised. If there was a boutique niche of piracy where they took Blu-rays and upsampled them to 4K displays uh, technologies, just so that you could have a completely dazzling ultra high resolution experience. Well, there, yeah, there was. What was the? Uh, there wasn't there a CD announcement of the first uh, uh, 4K player of some sort as well, or was it just no. the TV? 4K projector, I it believe, right? Projector. That's it was what only I'm the of. projector. Yes. Now at NAB. Uh, the company Red, which uh, makes the Red Epic and Red One cameras, which are 4K, uh, actually the Epic is 5K, um, <clears throat> they had a, a server that was serving essentially real 4K files. Um, and I only learned yesterday that they're actually planning to come out with a consumer version of that for under a thousand bucks next what? year. I mean, that's, that's pricey, but not for 4K. That's amazing. Exactly, exactly. So I was quite shocked at that. I thought we were years away from actually getting 4K content. Now, the other problem is not very many movie studios are actually producing movies in 4K all the way from beginning to end. So we don't have a lot of content yet. Even if we have a, a playback device and even if we have a display device, we still need content, and that's going to be tricky. Uh, I think that's going to take a little longer for the studios to get on board with that. Look how long it took them to get on board with, with high def. Yeah, well, and look how long it's taken to get on board just with delivering internet television. Uh, yes. You know, I mean, we, we have the ability uh, to deliver Blu-ray quality high def television to your home over the internet. Nobody's well, doing I that. Wouldn't, I wouldn't say quite that. Well, you, you could. Uh, you could do it. If you had enough bandwidth coming into your home. Yeah, and, and we, we, we don't, you know, we, we, we have enough bandwidth theoretically. We don't have it rolling out to everybody's home. So we, right. we still need that piece. We need Fios or, or, or advances in Doxis or, you know, getting it to the curb. Uh, and, yep. and then we need to solve all these licensing issues uh, that, that have the studios fear, fearing putting anything 
on the internet. They, if if yep. they're putting anything, they're putting low quality video and they're putting all kinds That's of right. restrictions on it. Uh, yep. In which case, if you can get a 4K server for less than $1,000 and you can get a 4K projector, uh, which is actually quite a bit more expensive, and you can put it in your house, your, your only choice is going to be piracy at that point. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's true. I, well, and, and first of all, do you know, and I'd love to hear from Scott, what, how would you physically connect a 4K display to a, to a computer or a display? I mean, does HDMI even have a, a bandwidth to do that? Would you have multiple HDMIs shotgunned in there? That's a very good question. Actually, HDMI 1.4, the latest version, uh, does have the capability of carrying 4K, uh, which is uh, the resolution is uh, 4096 by 2160, I believe. Um, now, see, and, and it'll, that, car it'll carry that at 24 frames per second. It'll carry it only at 24 frames per second. It'll carry reduced 4K or, or what, the, what is called quad HD, which is uh, 3860 by uh, 3840 by 2160 or something along those lines. Some people call that 4K, but it's not quite. Uh, it'll carry that at 24 or 30. So nothing at 60, 60 frames per second. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, tell so, you what. But what, the, what it will really mean, what that really means is it'll require multiple uh, connectors to, to do anything really good in, uh, in 4K, yes. Yeah, and, and I'm convinced again, I mean, obviously th this will be an exceptional cinema level display, but I, I got to think that the early adopters, this, the outliers are going to be the people who want to run high-end computer systems. Because right now on this server PC that I'm using, I have four monitors that, that easily total that level of resolution. I, I mean, I suppose mm -hmm. so. But it's like, uh, I, and I would love it if I could replace all of this with one giant monitor, plenty of desk space for me to move everything that I needed to do. And, and, and it mm -hmm. would be, uh, you know, three, four feet tall, six feet wide, and that would be perfect for what I'm doing right here. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Yeah. Is there going to be a gap between, uh, like a huge gap between what we're capable of watching and what is actually offered to us? As more and more people are, are going to put pressure on the studios by cutting the cord for one reason or another. They're going to say, look, I can get a lot of great video on the web that's not studio created, or I just want to save the money, or I've got all this money you know, invested uh, in Blu-ray players with Netflix streaming and Hulu built in, and why would I pay uh, for, for service from the cable companies when I can do that? I mean, are, is it going to be A lot extra of people pressure? are doing that. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think it is going to be a lot of pressure. There's always pressure on the studios to to come up with something that that only they can provide and you can't get anywhere else. I think um, the key here is to say, look, okay, with your current bandwidth, uh, with your current internet, we're going to strike deals. We're going to we're going to cut through the red tape. We're going to tear up the existing model. We're going to strike deals and deliver streaming internet television movies to you at a reasonable price, at a decent price. Uh, I know it's going to. It's, it's going to piss everybody off on the cable side of things, but you say, look, we, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll work through these licensing agreements. It'll maybe take a year or so. If, if, if you have enough brave people, you could get it done. And then say, and where we're going to make the money and where the cable television company uh, can actually make money too is delivering 4K service, delivering that next level to say, look, you can't get this quality streaming over the internet for $7.99 a month from Hulu or Netflix. You're going to have to buy it on optical disc or you're going to have to buy a cable television service uh, to deliver it to you that is, that is brand new. And, and you can keep hopping that way and say, you know what? We will always have a new, better quality version that we can deliver to you for a premium while we deliver the vast amount at a reasonable price over the Internet. Could, could that not work? I think it could, absolutely. Um, but there, there is another problem that we haven't talked about yet, which is that um, Internet service providers are starting to really clamp down, put on these caps on how much you can download before they throttle your bandwidth. Right, and that's, that's why if, if you can get them to say, look, you're going to make your money on delivering high-quality service limited like you do cable television right now, stop the cap. Stop that ridiculousness. Yeah. Invest and, in your networks. Now, now, one of the things that really shocked me a decade ago when we switched over from analog cable over to digital was they would tout the high-quality digital sound, but you found out real quick that in order to get a vast array of channels, they were reducing the bandwidth on any one channel to where you, you would go to the science channel, let's say one of the lower tier digital channels, and it would be, it would be so pixely and garbage where it, it actually looked worse than you were getting with analog. 
is is it yes. where in this this future that we're we're postulating uh, is it the case where if they reduce the number of channels they were trying to deliver, they would have more bandwidth for on-demand high-quality programming? And is this, is this a crunch? Are they going to have to make some hard decisions about how they deliver and how they use what bandwidth they have? That's my well, theory that's, here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's the big question. I, I would be so very surprised if they reduced the number of channels available. Yeah, I know. Uh, because, you know, they want as much variety and as much choice uh, they want to offer as much variety and choice as possible uh, so that they get the largest audience possible. And if they reduce that choice, I would think they would lose some audience and they would really not want to do that. But, but what if they did a marketing switcheroo, right, where they take uh, an entire tier of, say, 60 channels or so, they chop it out, and instead they open up, they're like, bad news, you don't have these channels anymore, good news, you now have five times as much bandwidth, and now we have this app built into our box that does on-demand or live streaming of all of these at HD quality. Is there a reason that couldn't work? No reason it couldn't work, but, uh, again, it comes <laughs> yeah. down to comes down to the... To the uh, to the consumer, you know, do they want quality or do they want convenience and, and choice? Um, and uh, audio seems to have taught us that they want uh, more choice and more convenience and quality isn't as important as we look at MP3s and, and all that stuff. Uh, you know, the, the high quality audio formats of DVD audio and SACD duked it out for nothing. Yeah. And Schnago points out in the chat room, performance royalties and copyright licensing make any sort of new deals nearly impossible. That's the biggest flaw in my little plan that I just laid out is, we'll just <laughs> fix all that licensing. We'll Your magically make plan. that all the way. Angel Mercury points out those cable studios are going to want to uh, fight to be more than just a distribution method, too. That's another problem. Uh, so, yeah, exactly. Before we wrap up the question on the big story, uh, what do you guys say? Uh, is this is the postulate right that that smart TVs will never take off, or is it a case where it's an emerging space and we got to figure out what it is people want, and then eventually they'll be built into televisions? Scott, you first. I think I think smart TV functionality is already being built into, if not the majority of TVs, very soon it will be simply as another feature like 3D, um, and people are going to buy these TVs. The better TVs are going to have it. Just, and whether you use it or not doesn't matter almost. It's, it, but it is going to be there. I think that yeah. smart TV platform is going to fade a little bit. It's not going to catch on. Somebody's going to come up with a box. Maybe it's Google. Maybe it's a Roku or a Boxy uh, that is going to finally capture the attention of the marketplace and be the thing that everybody's like, oh, that works. That's what I want to have. And then... Apple is going to make a TV with their system built in. And you're going to have another one of these <laughs> Windows Mac battles with the Apple television sets yeah. and then the crazy cool box. And then you know, people will be like, ah, I, the Apple locks me into my television. I don't want to have that. But other people will say, no, but you get so many advantages from it. That's where I think it's going. What about you, Brian? Uh, I think that there's an important clue as to where we're headed coming up in the tube top section here. I don't want to say what it is, mm. but, uh, but I'm going to plant this little seed that will germinate two segments from now, and I'll explain what I'm talking about. You farmer, you. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you. Now people are going to have to stick around after we talk about our fabulous sponsors. That's right. You're going to have to listen to the sponsor, not only because you want to hear about the seed that is going to germinate, but Brian also <laughs> not only because we're going to talk about Brian's seed, not sure how much of a good tease that is, but <laughs> we are going to give you something for free right now. Thanks to Netflix. Netflix.com slash twit allows you to have 30 days free TV and movie streaming. Most of you have heard this already a thousand million times. So really, all we ask is that you spread the word. Go yes. and tell a friend who hasn't heard the good word yet that they can get 30 days free streaming television movies at Netflix.com. Oh, slash talk door to door. And when the soon as they open, say, <laughs> good news. And then tell them that the good news is that they have thousands of titles available for instant streaming to their Xbox 360, the Nintendo Wii, their PS3, their iPad, their iPhone, or even their personal computer. And then hand them a pamphlet about Netflix. And that pamphlet could just be a post-it note with Netflix.com slash twit written on it. There you go. Yeah. I like it. All right. Uh, let's move on to Film Falm. <laughs> Rest of the world already has it. We're getting it soon here in the United States. September 16th, I should have my hands on the Star Wars reissue Blu-ray set. Brian, yeah, baby, oh, baby. 
Now, this is uh, surprising to me. Normally, isn't it usually the other way? Don't don't we usually get content first, and then you get the global markets? Yeah, it's because we complain so much about the changes. It was you and me personally. They're punishing us. Screwed it up for everyone else. Luke is like, all right, fine. Tom, Brian, you've screwed it up for the, all of America. I'm punishing the entire country. Uh, Scott, are, are you uh, are you excited about this? Have you ordered the, uh, the I'm, Blu-rays? I'm very excited about it. I'm... Uh, to tell you the truth, I'm, I'm hoping to get a copy to review on my website, so uh, I haven't ordered it yet, uh, but uh, I did see it at the Cedia show. They were showing it uh, at the THX booth, and it looked great. Cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, and what is your position on the changes, the little tweaks that he made this time around? Well, I, I don't have any specific, I don't know a lot about those changes. I, I will tell you this, I had no problem with the updated effects on the Star Trek original uh, original series um, mm -hmm. reissue on Blu-ray, uh, and I think they're, and they are going to be doing that also on uh, Next Gen, I understand. Um, I don't know about the story changes uh, in, in Star Trek, so, I mean, in Star Wars. They didn't, so, they didn't uh, change the story as much this time as he did last time around, but he, he you know, he added Darth Vader yelling no at one point, and oh yeah, that's that sounds kind of hokey to me. I yes. heard that too. Um, yeah, you know what? And uh, this will be hopefully the last time we talk about this on the show because I think we've we've sort of beaten it to death. But in a conversation recently, it was I can't even remember who I was talking to, but but it would have been great. And I think he would have kept a tremendous amount of goodwill if George Lucas had instead made two tracks, made the archival track that was all about preserving this film as it was at its time and trying to, even when you do have to make changes, because sometimes, you know, some theaters would only play mono, someone would play stereo, and you have to tweak it, mm -hmm. doing your best to keep to exactly what it was, and then also having this continuous, ever-evolving, always-improving tinker track that you could go on. And then, I mean, that, I don't see how that would have caused any confusion or made anyone feel uh, screwed over the way the, the, there's some latent fanboy rage that's been tapped into with this last round of changes. On a positive mm -hmm. note, uh, if you have ordered, if you've pre-ordered, uh, and you go to wherever you've ordered from, I've tried this on Amazon, I'm not sure if it works at other places, and you cancel your shipping and change it, don't cancel your order you will end up having your ship date update to an earlier time. I had pre-ordered, and it wasn't going to ship till September 23rd. I got this tip from a guy on Twitter, uh, and it turns out that I, I just like said, change shipping. I changed it to the same shipping that I already had, and it updated the date and said, oh, now you get it on September 16th. So cool. you might want to check that little trick out. Also, yeah, uh, really. George oh. Lucas is going to use a lot of the money from the sales of Blu-ray to fund his incredible sand crawler building in now Singapore. This is awesome. We've got the pictures of it right here. We're going to jump forward. This is from a Slashdot article. And first of all, I didn't know that Lucasfilm, or Lucas, LucasArts, Lucasfilm, I don't know which one it is, but, but so Lucasfilm. big that they have an entire bureau in Singapore and that they could uh, blow the kind of money to, to do this art, uh, artistic masterpiece is what it is. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I'm frustrated with the Blu-ray changes. I'm in love with this building. And especially the novel way they were able to create the illusion of gigantic volume that you get from a sand crawler by, uh, that's actually kind of hollow on the inside. That's a giant horseshoe design. If you scroll down, you should be able to see it in there. There's an inner courtyard. There's a, a hundred seat, highest quality, uh, de, you know, uh, screening room. Uh, and I just love the fact that it's clearly a giant sand crawler. Does it have Tuscan Raiders yeah. in it? Um, <laughs> they don't serve no, their code no, there. No, Jawas. Jawas. It's full, it's, full, it's full of Jawas. Thank goodness. <laughs> it's safe. You can and go droids. In. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it, great place to pick up a used droid. I'd love to think of this yeah, Willy really, Wonka exactly. world where they make the movies with Jawa labor the way Willy Wonka did with the Oompa Loompas. You go in and it's a magical right, right. <laughs> digital uh, Netflix. Just, just make sure you don't get a droid with a, with a bad motivator. Yeah. <laughs> no R5-D4. Uh, Net <laughs> Netflix has updated their apps to support all Android 2.2 and 2.3 devices. So, Android, your, your long national Netflix nightmare is over. Uh, you can now... <sighs> Any Froyo or gingerbread handset can play the Netflix app. So that's cool. Is this going to continue to be a problem every time there's a new release of the OS? Or is it, there's backwards compatibility? You know built? what? I think now it'll be okay. It's all, it's all chip-level DRM stuff that they have to get their hooks into. So uh, I think I, I don't understand it entirely, but I think this means that it's smooth sailing from here on out. Because they will have to update the app, 
with every operating system, but I, I don't think it'll be as complicated of an update as this first attempt was. Uh, also, I saw this on Ars Technica. A really interesting a film is being made by the folks who make the PhD comics, the piled high and deeper comics. It's a humorous, point blank, accurate take, they say, on the everyday struggle scientists faces in grad school. But if uh, followers of the comic have noticed lately that the number of issues have fallen off, and apparently some uber geeks at Caltech have produced a live action film adaptation of the comics with the popular characters, and it will be debuting on campuses worldwide this Thursday, September 15th. Yeah, I liked the fact that of everything I read in the article, and, and I'm not familiar with the PhD comic, and for, but now after reading this, i got to go back and, uh, and yeah, read it. Yeah, I know, it. me too. But, uh, one of the things I like the most is that they want to reject in the film, uh, or at least that's, this is what I gathered from it, uh, the stereotypes that you have associated with the mad scientist image, that you always have to have smoking beakers, and anytime something goes wrong, it has to explode. Yeah. And instead, that it should capture those very real moments when just a number comes up and it's the wrong number, and you're just like, well expletive you know that kind of thing but the only thing i don't know is if you can get this thing somewhere on the web well when when is it supposed to be hitting this thursday uh, it hits campuses but it doesn't uh it doesn't say what, is that, what does that mean though i mean are they are they showing it in the campus theater or what yeah there, sure there's a schedule if you go to uh phdcomics.com slash movie uh there's a schedule of what different campuses will be showing it for instance university of texas at austin gets it on october 12th kicks off at ucla and drexel and a few other schools this thursday and then it's sort of touring around uh but i was hoping maybe they would also you know make for sale uh, a version that i, c I could download I'm sure they will. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And we, we, we see this with a lot of small indie films. They do the, the circuit. It's, it's kind of neat on the, on the indie level how close it is to like a touring stage show where it's like usually the filmmakers go along and you do Q&A. We saw this with uh, uh, Kevin Smith and his uh, yeah. Red State recently. Um, I'm sure it'll make this tour and then become... And then become our... available. That, uh, yeah, that, that's a reasonable way of doing it. Uh, finally, William Shatner's documentary, The Captains, which was seen on TV earlier this year, is going to be released on DVD in October. That's the one, if you haven't heard about it, where he actually goes and visits with Patrick Stewart, Kate Mulgrew, uh, you know, all the folks who have played the captain, including the current captain in the reboot from J.J. Abrams. Uh, Did it's you a, see this? It, uh, it, it's fascinating. It's really fun to watch. And, uh, and I, I can't wait for it to, to come out on DVD so I can watch it again because I, 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 I didn't DVR it like an idiot. I should have. <laughs> Unfortunately, now, I, I missed it somehow. I don't know how, how I was able to miss that, but I did. So I can't wait for the DVD either. Although why are they not coming out on Blu-ray? I don't know. You probably didn't shoot it in high enough resolution. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, and also, you know, oftentimes with documentaries, they'll on purpose avoid Blu-ray because so often they're working with super low quality home video to tell yeah. stories and backstories right. and stuff that all Blu-ray will do is true. shine a light on that. And, yeah, and Lance no, Coviello right says it's still showing on Epix uh, if you have a Roku, which I didn't realize you can actually stream it from the Epix channel because Epix is where I saw it on TV. So that's, awesome. that's a good way, a good workaround uh, to get to it. Thanks for that tip, uh, Lance. And then, Scott, in the pre-show, you were mentioning that The Next Generation is coming to Blu-ray as well. That's right. Um, I just heard this at the Cedia show. Uh, they're going to redo the uh, special effects. Uh, it was shot on film, so it can be re-scanned re, um, at uh, high def. And, and so I think what I heard was that the first uh, release is going to be the pilot, uh, Encounter at Farpoint, uh, with a couple other episodes, sort of as a test run, I think. It's not really going to be Encounter like Encounter at Farpoint is your test? That's like one of the worst well, episodes. Well, but, but yeah, then again, I agree. Test, I agree. That's what you got to do. You don't test, you're not going to test it on one of the, the epic episodes that we all remember, you know, when Picard becomes a Borg or something like that. You're going to test it on, you know, it makes sense. It's the first and it's Pilar also, at Tanagra. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, oh, yeah. that was a great episode. I, I love stop, that episode. <laughs> stop mocking that episode. That was a great episode. No, that's what, that's one I would like to see done. Yeah, well, oh, absolutely. It, sure it will. If, if Encounter at Farpoint is, you know, does well and it's well received with, because uh, there will be changes when you're improving. I'm sure that they're not going to on purpose try to make the redone effects look early 1990s, late 1980s appropriate. I'm sure that they'll make them look good for what they are. And George yeah, Lucas, exactly. please listen. What they did with Star Trek, the original series, is they redid the graphics, but you could also still watch the original if you yes. so chose. I loved that. Yes, yes, and I do like that too. Yep. Let's move on to Tube Tops. All 
All right, we got a lot of good uh, TV hardware coming out of Cedia, Scott. Uh, I would have liked to have been there, too, with you. Sony uh, has got a new streaming media box and updated Google TV hardware. Did you get a chance to see this one while you were there? I, I didn't. I saw the streaming, uh, well, a sort of a streaming media speaker thing. Um, looks kind of like a... Uh, <laughs> An atomic uh, cooling tower. I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to. No, this was Google TV hardware with a new ah, release okay. upgrade to Honeycomb being showed off. So it's sort of like, no, okay, we're leaving all. the other Google TV stuff with Logitech behind. And this is, this mm -hmm. is what Google TV is going to be next. Uh, I think that there was also the streamer, the SMP N200. Is that the, the cooling tower one that you're, you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, I think so. A little, little speaker thing. Yeah. Uh, wireless, you can move it around your house, it streams music from, from a server. Um, that's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, so um, I, you know, I, I, I was... Go ahead. I was going to say, I, I meant, I, I, when I first saw Google TV, I thought that was going to be the magic box that you were referring to earlier. Turned out not to be the case. No, not at all. Not at all. But I originally, when I first saw it, I thought, oh, maybe this is finally that magic box. Just like you were talking about. Um, maybe the second iteration will be. I don't know. It's don't got know. the potential for it. So I can see an upgrade to Honeycomb uh, and some better hardware. Not that Logitech made bad hardware, but something that takes a little better advantage uh, could help. The biggest thing, though, is actually getting the blocks lifted from the streaming video so that you, you exactly so that you don't you know go into the browser and try to go to nbc.com and they, they they don't give you anything which if you add apps which they're supposed to do that might be a way because it, now you've got all of these television networks doing apps they could say okay you'll sell your app in the android marketplace and then people can watch it on their google tv and all of a sudden bingo you've got a la carte television yeah right. this is exactly. um Looking at this one photo has me super excited because it is, and you nailed it, Scott. This is what I thought Google TV was going to be when they announced it to begin with. And this, I'm tremendously yep. excited about this. And this is the kind of thing, once we get to a certain level, uh, that I can see built into every every television. And, and you're, Scott's 100% right. You're going to see smart televisions anyway. Uh, I just hope they get smart enough to they, where they could start you know, representing stuff this well. Also, uh, this is like sort of on the other end of the scale, the Chumby Net TV. Uh, it's just a little box that passes through an HDMI signal, but adds in the Chumby operating system. So without <laughs> sacrificing the ability to watch TV, you can get apps anywhere, Twitter, Facebook, SMS, email, uh, even some of the little weather apps and things. And it's controlled by an infrared remote, uh, so you can you can use it to control your television as well. It's a nifty little gadget. Or by your, uh, mm. your uh, or I guess, you know, your, the interface also works with your Android device on air. And this yeah, is, right. a, my, my, my seed is germinating now. This is the middle step <laughs> of the, to, to getting smart TVs on, uh, on uh, full acceptance, right? I love the idea that this is a physical object that is a layer that you're putting in between the content coming in and the content showing up on the screen and that you control what you want in the interface. Nowadays, I mean, we have kids who are, are coming up on adulthood, 18 years or so, who have never experienced television the way you and I did when we were kids. They've never experienced television as being the only thing you watched at any given time. They've always had other things happening all around them. They've had iPads in their, uh, on their lap, laptops, their computer open. And I think this is a welcome addition to start bringing in this middle layer between the content and you. It's more of the stuff that you want. And eventually, what I see is, is more of this type of thing until finally this is the experience that's just built into the, um, uh, the, the television itself, where it's like the hardware. But, but I feel like there's significant amount of hardware that needs to improve before uh, it could be in every television and actually used all the time. Scott, what do you think of this little thing? It's you know, it's a it's a tiny little device. It only uses Wi-Fi, so you you know, you're not going to use it for a ton of streaming necessarily, but it's so right. convenient. It sure sure seems like it. I had never heard of it before, um, but uh, but yeah, you just you just put it in line with your HDMI cable. Is that yeah. the idea? Yeah, exactly. And whatever's going into that <laughs> HDMI gets passed right through, and then there's overlays for for all this other net stuff that you want to add. I, you know, I have to, I have to say that that. Um, uh, what Brian was talking about earlier, and you, I think, too, um, b about uh, people doing the kids, the kids these days, and they're doing their, <laughs> you know, and they're 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 do on their laptops or their cell phones, and they're doing stuff. Uh, I've got a niece who 
visited me and, and we were watching TV and she was doing this other stuff. And, and I said, how, how can you do two or three things at once? And she said, I, I can't do one thing at a time. That, that's uncomfortable to me. I yeah. have to do two or three things at once. And I, I just, I still question whether or not when you do things that way, if you're not missing out on something, if you're not getting less uh, experience somehow because you're diluting it so much. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm just an old fart. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of on that same fence where it's like, well, I think if I could focus more and not be distracted, I would get more out of things. But at the same time, when you're like reading Twitter while you're watching something live, it can enhance the experience, especially live events like like presidential elections or sporting games or, or the Oscars, well, stuff like that. So, there, so it's, that, it's that got may very well cool be, stuff. Yeah. yeah. Sure. That All may right. well be. There's also a, uh, a new item from Move TV, uh, the Movia Move TV platform, motion control options added to your TV and set-top box. So this isn't something you can, add, you can buy yet. It's a platform. Uh, do we need motion control for our, for our remote control, Brian? Uh, I think you could probably guess what I'm going to say here. We got to yes! wait. Yes! You're gonna... <laughs> no, the answer is no, not yet, not for a while. It, uh, what will happen is we will come to adopt motion control for some completely other purpose. Right now, everybody's happy with their remotes. They're happy with not looking down. They're happy with using their thumb and making very minuscule movements to cause big things to happen. Uh, to get somebody who's accustomed to that to want to wave their hands around or whatever else, it's not going to happen. All these controls are still touchy, still dicey. However... We will come to love motion control for some unforeseen application that nobody's even thought of uh, yet. That's interesting. When we do, we will eventually learn to speak that language, and then we'll be happy to do it for whatever it is we're watching on TV as well. But it's going to come from the outside. It's not going to come from within. Everyone's perfectly happy with their remotes. Scott, do you want motion control, or are you good with the old-fashioned no, push button? I'm, to I'm totally with Brian on this one, too. Um, I, I've, I've seen motion control demonstrated at CES and CD, in fact, for the last couple of years. Itachi did it a few years ago, and it just seemed like, why why make these big gestures when, as Brian says, exactly, you just make these micro-movements, and you know where your fingers are supposed to go. It, it, I tried these things, and it took a while to, to get used to it. I don't think it's going to take off until perhaps, as he says, uh, you know, something else brings it in. You know, I haven't tried the movie system, so I can't say for sure, but I have used Connect. To do my motion control of television. See, that makes sense to me because uh, in a gaming situation, if you're playing tennis or doing something like that, uh, you know, you, you have this tactile experience. That makes some sense to me. I, I've, I've used it to do video, too, to control like ESPN 360 and, other, and Zoom videos and other things. Oh, yeah? And I can see where it will eventually be much better than a remote, but it's not quite there. Because when, when it starts to work, when I start to get the momentum, it's so nice to be like, wow, I just, I flip and now, I, oh, and now I see, oh, tennis, boom. Yeah, just select that. And I, I, all of a sudden I get going and then suddenly it loses my hand. And it's like, oh, uh, hold yes. on, mm. hold on. Yeah, okay, now it's got me again. Uh, whereas, you know, you're right. If I pick up a remote, it's flip, 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 flip. may take a little longer, Ooh, but it's done. reliable. Yeah, exactly. I can also see a future, I think a big part of this is going to be when we have some kind of uniform interaction, uh, like an artificial intelligence type thing, where a combination of gestures and verbal cues becomes so natural and it hits 99.9% yeah. of the time. And you could say, uh, Xbox, pull up all of my favorite sports. And then it'll pull them up there and then you'll, and you could just go, no, 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 no. Um, do you, have, do you have the race uh, that was on Tuesday? And he'll say, yes, it's right here. You're like, yeah, that one. Yes, and it's Brian. Like, Here's That's the, the race you were looking for. for. There's no reason we can't do it. We're already seeing <laughs> leaps and strides getting closer and closer to that. There's also no reason Android users can't watch all the free content they want from Hulu on their mobile phone if they use the Orb Live app from Woo! Orb Networks, which was previously only available on iOS devices, uh, but offers streaming now to both 3G and Wi-Fi connected devices. In addition to Hulu, it can also serve up Netflix, YouTube, ESPN3, and others. Now, Orb Live is not a service. They're sort of like Slingbox. Uh, in fact, that's, uh, that's, I've always compared them to Slingbox over the years because you can either install Orb on a computer and put it on your television, and that kind of worked like a Slingbox, uh, and it's an open source uh, program. Now they're, they're, they've added it to telephones, so you you can actually sling content 
uh, from Hulu and other distributors from your home computer. So there's the catch. You actually have to have Orb running on a home computer, and then it's just taking the video that you would normally have on that computer and like a VNC type of system, sending it over to your phone, and it's now available for Android users. So this is this is similar to the Play-On system that I use on my Xbox. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah. No, and I love I love the Play-On system, and I wonder, this is one of those things where it's like, as long as the technology, and I assume they're not even breaking any laws, because like the Sling Box, you're, you're taking content, it's being played on your computer, you're just throwing the visual to another device. Uh, I suspect that as this grows in popularity and we get more of these, that's going to be the final move that makes people uh, say, okay, we can't fight them anymore. Because yeah. right now we're still dealing with this cat and mouse of like, no, Hulu's what you watch on your computer, and meanwhile you should watch the channels on your live TV, that kind of thing. Yeah, it makes us do these ridiculous uh, backward flips where it's like, my, my phone is perfectly capable of streaming Hulu video. My Android phone can do that. But, oh, you're blocking it. So, okay, fine. I am going to go and run it on my desktop computer where you don't block it and send it through Orb over to my phone. Now what are you going to do? Ugh. Yeah. This sounds too complicated to me. The exact, it, well, it's, it's making it too complicated when it doesn't need to be. Although, yeah, although exactly. devices like uh, you know systems like the Orb are are going to be the redemption of it. I mean, it'll add another unnecessary la layer that serves only to protect people from the legal standpoint. But it, uh, from the consumer standpoint, it will be the pleasurable experience that we thought we ought to get straight from Hulu to begin with. Yeah, and eventually people will, you know, as as, as society moves on, they'll look around and go, "Why are we doing this again? That doesn't yes. make any sense. Let's change the law." <laughs> Exactly. Uh, NBC, TNT, and TBS all bringing full-length television episodes to iOS devices through apps. In fact, uh, NBC.com's app was one of the top downloaded iPad apps when I checked yesterday. Uh, so you can now... You, you, you can't. You can't. You got to pay for Hulu Plus if you want to get some stuff. But if you actually download the Direct app, this is kind of what I was alluding to earlier. You can get some kind of a la carte video streaming. Once again, on an iPad, it's not going to be on your home television, but it's it's some access over the internet. Now, is this is this? Are you happy with this direction? Because unfortunately, this kind of fragmentation means that instead of just one app to watch the shows we want, like through a Hulu, because we keep wanting this unified experience where we could just get yes. everything. Instead, we're looking at 18 million different apps. But on the flip side, is that so different from having 18 million different channels and you just picking which channels you want to get by downloading and installing those particular apps? What do you think, Scott? That's a great, that's a great point. It's exactly right. Um, I, 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 I do want that universal box, but um, I think Brian's point that, you know, that, hey, it's, it's no different than just having a bunch of different uh, uh, channels to watch. Um, as long as you have those apps available, and I, I hope that, I mean, NBC, TNT, and TBS are bringing them out. Uh, I hope the other networks follow suit. Now, one uh, one tweak to this that you you should know is in I'm not sure which apps whether all of them do this, but I know the NBC one made me tell them what my cable company was. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of that. So you're not just getting the stuff for free. Right. Uh, you you still have to. You got to tell them something. Yeah, and I guess if you get it over the air, I don't know how that works. Ideally, I think we'd all love something where you could indicate your favorite programs, and I, I don't know that that you do this any easier by having 18 million different apps out there but we want a heads up like oh by the way that new episode uh, hey reminder always sunny in philadelphia is coming back to tv right. you know you add that to your queue you liked it before and you're like oh yeah absolutely and then it, it reminds you of what shows it has available i use side reel for that uh, the sidereel.com is, is a place often connected with piracy because they used to be known as a place where you could get links to streaming videos of anything online, but they've actually changed their, uh, their direction quite a bit, and they're now a, a, an aggregator of information about all kinds of video, whether it's on the web, TV, or otherwise, and they oh, have this awesome. great calendar function and tracker that'll just send me an email saying, hey, you know what, this, this show that you were interested in watching, it, it premieres this week. Uh, and you can also keep track of, if you're catching up on older seasons, uh, you can keep track of what episodes you've watched. One more bit of speculation from the chat room. Perfect Face for Radio suggests that since we have all these iOS apps, if Apple allowed these apps to run on the you know mysterious Apple TV that may or may not exist, then uh, does that make the Apple TV the magic box that allows us to get whatever we want, however we want? It could. If we, if we get all access to all that stuff, it could. I mean, if anyone's got the exactly. muscle to get the agreements worked out, it's going to be Apple. So that's, a, that's something to watch yeah. for. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, exactly right. Finally, in our tube tops, uh, Farscape, complete Blu-ray series, oh. coming November 15th. Now, do Cannot you think wait. Big Farscape fan, Scott? Oh, serious Farscape fan. Serious. Includes now, over uh, 15 seen... hours of bonus programming highlighted by a brand new documentary featuring Ben Browder, Claudia Black, uh, creators Rock Neil Bannon, Henson, and writer Richard Manning. That is going to be so awesome. Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, so, so my question is, now I, I unfortunately only watched one or two episodes of Farscape when it was on, but uh, I assume, again, that it was filmed, so it's easy to up, upscale to Blu-ray, but are they redoing the I assume the so, yeah. Good question. I don't know. It did not say know. in the I press hope. release I read uh, whether this was going to be uh, up, upscaled uh, or, or, or not, but I, I assume if they're putting it on Blu-ray that they are. It'll be interesting to see how well the, the effects survive the, the half decade it's been. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But that, that was truly one of my all-time favorite sci-fi series. Just wow. fabulous. All right, uh, we, as you may have noticed, we didn't talk about what we're watching in Film Falm or Tube Tops. We're starting a new segment, which means we, we need an intro, Brian. Yes. So, uh, I, or, uh, what do you think? You, you want to give people a direction here? Yeah, you so wanna, uh, we need it to be short, like two or three seconds. Uh, probably call it what we're watching. Yep. That's what, I think that's what we're going to call it. Uh, right. and, and I don't know, any other direction beyond that or just let people go, go to town? You have no idea how bad I want to just give a horrible mishmash like, I want opera death metal, or I want <laughs> someone maybe shouting it, or it's just like, I mean, I, whatever it is, they're going to surprise us and it'll be awesome. And send it to frameratereshow at gmail.com. Just send a link to it uh, wherever you create it, if you create something. Uh, the best stuff, all of our intros have come from you people in the chat realm so uh we really appreciate it and some people who don't even make it in the chat room but they're, they're just out there watching uh That's so let's talk about what we're watching brian are you finally starting the fringe fest i i don't know if you uh notice this about me tom from the fact that i was with you just a couple of days ago but uh, i've been doing a lot of traveling no i did so, i did so I, as, I know you haven't been able to catch up on it yet but do you have time finally now you know what? As it as it happens, I have to accompany the misses on a boring set of chores yesterday, where I have to be available but not doing anything. Ah. So I'm going to load up my iPad, and tomorrow's the great fringe binge. I'm going to see how close to the end of season one I can get. But I, and also, I still have to get caught up on Breaking Bad as well. And and I think I saw some ads coming up for Always Sunny in Philadelphia. I don't know when that drops, but I'm super stoked about it. Yeah, the Philadelphia Phillies are also uh, using the Always Sunny in Philadelphia logo and stuff to promote their. Post-season run. That is awesome. Yeah. You, you know the whole, uh, you watched Always Sunny in Philadelphia, right? I have not seen it yet, no. Okay, shame on you. Yes, this, I know. Okay, this is, we're going to have the great Always Sunny in Philadelphia experience. I've seen a few episodes because Eileen started watching it, but I didn't get to catch up on it. So, so funny. Then I'm not going to reference the story I was going to tell, but it's, it's so good. I love it. It's, yeah. Uh, I'm still watching all the stuff that I've been watching uh, that I've recommended. Doctor Who uh, season, you know, re restarted. Uh, and frankly, I think it's better than the first half. Uh, they got back to some classic storytelling. I think that the, the 11th Doctor is really hitting his stride. Uh, True Blood wrapped up, season finale. Kind of an uh season for me. It was okay. Didn't love it. Uh, Breaking Bad kicking ass. Uh, just is it? Taking names. So I, I'm it's loving killing it. killing being behind. I can't wait to get caught up. Now, Eureka, also, I'm a fan of. It's it's not for everyone, but it, that one's perking along great. I'm having a good time watching that. And Haven, I still think, as I've said before, one of the most underrated shows on television. Still loving that. Uh, Jason Priestley, guest starring and guest directing several awesome. episodes of Haven. Uh, so worth checking out maybe just for that. And then coming up tomorrow, or tonight, actually, Tuesday, at 9 p.m. on the CW, Ringer with Sarah Michelle Geller. Have no idea if this is going to be any good or not, but I figure it's Buffy. I got, I got to sample it. Yeah, she's been way out of the TV game for a long time, right? I mean, what's the last thing she's done? I mean, yeah, I think, I think she was trying to break into movies for a while, so I'm not sure she's done any... Uh, I, she certainly hasn't been the star of a television show since uh, Buffy. And Ringer is the idea there's twins, one of them dies, and the other one tries to take her place and take over her life, so... We'll see. We'll see how that goes. Scott, you have you been uh, watching anything interesting, either movies or TV? It doesn't really matter. Um, sure, I've actually um, been watching some TV. Um, I, I tried Alphas. I don't know if you guys watched that or not. I, I, I watched the first episode and I just couldn't. I just it, it wasn't bad. I just never went back. 
Uh, no, dude, I get no. so many emails from people telling us we have to check out Alphas. So, I mean, that's on the list as well. No, I just it, it just didn't grab me, so I, I'm not really watching it. I got to tell you, you've been going over a lot of sci-fi, which is all great. Um, but the show that I'm most into these days is Pawn Stars. Oh, yeah, yeah, dude. You know that show? Of course. As a matter of fact, there was talk about me being on an episode for that for a while. No kidding. Uh, no kidding. Uh, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I talked to the producer about doing that. Uh, in fact, because there was there was talk about that crossover, I went back and I watched a whole season of them. Uh, they do a really good job of of isolating, you know, sticking a finger right in that part of the brain that uh, that that loves to see, you know, uh, good bargains found, and they have, you know, there's storytelling built into it, both with the yeah, lots of great history and stuff, but the interaction between the grandfather, the old man, yep. and uh, and Rick and uh, uh, Corey and Chumley. Uh, is is really hilarious. I think I just find it very good. Um, it's it's very male. <laughs> gotcha. Yes. Um, so anyway, I, I like that one. Uh, last night was the season finale of The Closer, which I my wife and I've been watching since it's be, since the beginning. I think that's a great show, great crime drama, good good com comedic uh, highlights uh, tones in it. And um, let's see what else have I been watching lately? Not a lot. I've been gone and. Yeah, it's the summer to. too. You get you you got yeah, a lot of summer exactly. replacement stuff. So, um, yeah, I'm, yeah. you know, in a couple of weeks, things are really going to start uh, uh, cranking up. Uh, we've got the uh, what's the ABC show with the pilots from Oh Pan Am. Pan Am. Oh, is there any way? Can anyone look at the marketing for Pan Am and not just instantly say, Mad Men. "Oh, somebody wants to cash in on Mad Men"? Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, there's there's some other you know not a lot of sci-fi coming on the broadcast networks but a lot of fantasy oriented stuff it seems like uh, some you know fairy tale oriented uh, stuff mm -hmm. we'll, we'll take we'll take a closer look at that uh, in maybe next week when we get closer I assume to you guys are into game of, Game of Thrones oh yeah oh my gosh yeah no we we it's, it's a little too violent for me I have to tell you what well is there also too much awesome nudity and too much well, bad at intrigue. And nudity's fine. I have no problem with that at all. I love it, in <laughs> fact. But um, <laughs> um, there's a lot of fighting and blood and stuff that I saw anyway. A little when I took a little bit of well, it. Well, Scott, that's the Game of Thrones. You either win or you die. Scott's, uh, <laughs> like, like Scott's answer is, guys, it's a big throne. You can share, just you sit on this yeah. side and you sit on that side. Can't you all share it? Put some cushions okay. down. <laughs> Yeah, right, exactly. It can be a love seat. A <laughs> love seat. Love seat. A <laughs> game of love seats. Totally. There you go. <laughs> and we've got a title. <laughs> All right. Let's wrap up with some feedback. We're, we don't have any interference this week. We're going to go right into the feedback, Chad. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. See, in intros to segments we could never make on our own. Exactly. <laughs> I would never do that. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's start off with Sabriel saying, I believe Nintendo hit on something without even knowing it when it comes to internet television. Now, I don't expect them to do any internet TV anytime soon. However, I think they have the perfect UI for it. The Wii OS as it were, already uses things called channels for the various games and programs the Wii uses. It has the perfect device for selecting them, a remote control-like controller, point to what you want, and it loads up. If I recall correctly, this was intentional. They wanted the general public to be familiar with the controls right from the start when they booted the hardware up for the first time without needing a manual. Suppose if hardware manufacturers could overcome any would-be patent wars, then they may be on to helping the market out. Would you guys want a uh, television Television interface that was based on the Wii. Oh my gosh, yes. But but again, we might leapfrog it if we if we see that kind of uh, artificially intelligent back and forth talking thing. The stuff they aspire for on the the Connect, I can see that superseding it. But outside of that, uh, the the Wii U, I mean, especially getting hands on with it at E3, it w it's an exceptional interface. I've never played with it, so I couldn't tell you. There you go. It's not going <laughs> There's no we in Wilkinson. One too many eyes. No, nope. nope, that's right. Too many eyes. 
We got another email from Tensor Guy who says, Hello, Tom and Brian love the show. So Netflix finally made it to Latin America. With the final rollout in Central America last night, the whole hemisphere now has access to Netflix in one form or another. As a frame rate and longtime Twit fan, I've been anxiously awaiting for this service. The initial reports of Netflix making a deal with Mexican television giant Televisa filled me with dread that Netflix was just going to be an online version of Televisa. Nothing could be farther from the truth. At exactly 8 p.m. last night, the webpage went live and immediately offered a month free it also had some interesting tutorials on how to connect the computer to the flat screen for uh, flat screen TV for maximum enjoyment. After the initial survey of my viewing preferences, the experience began. He says that the pros, of course, seven ninety nine price, you can't beat that. Excellent stream quality, language options that are great. Most titles available in HD: Star Trek, Next Generation, Mad Men, Grey's Anatomy. Uh, children's section extremely extensive. Telenovelas and soaps are available, but not focused. And customer service is knowledgeable and cordial, but the cons are the selection is good but severely limited. Now hold on, how can it be both? I guess I guess it's like <laughs> what's there is good. They don't have crap. Okay. There's just okay. not much of it. That's how I read that. All right, right. Some titles right. are only available in Portuguese and Spanish audio, not English. Star Trek: Next Generation being the most blatant offender. Now that's that's crazy. I don't know why they would do that. Resolution drops once in a while. Well, that's a universal complaint. Uh, if you find the comments under cons a bit limited, it's because I could not find more things to gripe about. The main th uh, problem is the limited selection, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, really can't complain about the service because Netflix has begun to do what potential customers all around the world have requested for years. Sell to us. Take our money. Please just don't ignore us and hope we don't find ways to watch. Hope this is a model that Amazon and others follow quickly. Tensor Thank guy. you, Jaime. I mean, Tensor Guy, uh, for, for the review of something that we would not have had a chance to, to experience for and ourselves. That's great. Never would have known. I really love that. Thanks for taking the time to write that up for us. Finally, Harold wrote in and said, not sure whether to be intrigued or fearful. Uh, and he's, he's talking about a, uh, a link at imdb.com to an upcoming project uh, from the Farrelly brothers, The Three Stooges, for April 4th, 2012 release. So it's a what? A dark reimagining? A reboot? No, 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 no. I don't know. He says he says not the Cohen brothers. Damn, could be worse, I suppose. It might have been the Wachowski siblings. OMG, they've got Snooky, the situations, and others from the Jersey Shore in it too. <laughs> now I wish Man. the Wachowskis were helming it. Okay, well, okay. <laughs> Let's not get indignant about this. Uh, it's not like the Three Stooges is some hallowed franchise and we're afraid somebody's going to drive it into the ground. I mean, the Three Stooges were, were, were a stage comedy team who... who what, what do you... Okay, now, hold on. Let's now stop that. <laughs> now. <laughs> uh, no, good for them for trying, you know? Like, whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> That's all I have to say about it, too. <laughs> you really oh, you think a good that? idea for them for trying? I guess the Farrelly brothers are pretty brilliant. If anybody could pull it off, they could. Yes. Well, and it's all going to boil down on who the people are. I mean, it's it all the about the freaking cast of Jersey Shore. That well, I mean, there there happen. I think those are cameos that show up. Oh, okay. All right. They're not the they're not the actual Stooges. Yeah. Yeah, We're going to play Larry them, Curly and Mo. Right. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I will. I will try to keep an open mind. <laughs> uh, you know what? If you want to see something that's very Three Stooges-esque, or I guess really they were riffing more on the Marx Brothers at the time, and it has a way young John Turturro. Have you ever seen Brain Donors? Oh, I thought you were going to say The Piano. No. No. <laughs> No, I have no, I never, never seen have, Brain no. Donors. Uh, I ought to see if it's on Netflix instant streaming, but they were going for a very Marx Brothers type things in the you know the early 90s, and um, it, it lasted exactly one day in the movie theater when I worked there. And in fact, for the, for the next several years, when a movie came and left in just one weekend, we call it polling of Brain Donors. But, wow. uh, but the movie itself wasn't <laughs> bad, and uh, it's interesting to see John Turturro back at that age. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. That sounds cool. All right, that's it for this edition of Frame Rate. Scott Wilkinson, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us. It was great having you along. Oh, you bet. Oh, it's great great to be on. Uh, happy to be here anytime. Let folks know about uh, Home Theater Geeks and HomeTheater.com and all the stuff that you do there. Oh, sure, yeah. Home Theater Geeks is my podcast on the Twit Network. Um, just yesterday, um, we uh, did a big uh, wrap-up of the Cedia show, so uh, check out that when uh, it's – I think it's posted now, so you should be able to, to get that. Uh, next week, <clears throat> I, I still don't have a final confirmation, but it's looking very good. My guest is going to be, hopefully, uh, John Dykstra, a Oscar-winning no special kidding. effects uh, wizard. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've, was, I've heard his name bandied, bandied about it at the Oscars, of, of course. Yeah. 
Exactly, exactly. His latest project was uh, X-Men First Class, which I thought was a great X-Men movie. Um, he also worked on the original Star Wars and a uh, bunch of other stuff. Silent Running, I uh, can't remember which else, but tons of them. Anyway, uh, hopefully that's next Monday. And uh, after that, uh, you know, who knows? All kinds of interesting guests talking about all kinds of interesting stuff. HomeTheater.com is uh, my, my website where we do reviews of products and um, reviews of movies and all kinds of interesting stuff for the home theater crew. So uh, please come check it out. Excellent. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Brian Brushwood. As always. So long, people. I don't have anything to plug outside of tonight on NSFW. If you stick around, we're going to have uh, Butch Hartman, creator of the Fairly Odd Parents, joining us. We're going to create some children's programming on NSFW. Excellent. Send us your emails, frameratereshow at gmail.com, and find us on the web, twit.tv slash fr. See you next time. <laughs>